few of us who are in the room and those who are, uh, who are joining with us virtually um, will have a little bit of a discourse on the idea of dreams and the distress that comes with dreams. It feels particularly relevant because last night I had a very vivid dream. I think my mind was working through something or maybe it knew that I was going to speak about dreams this morning. So I wanna share with you a little piece of Torah about the human dealings with the distress of dreams and what the rabbis of the Gemara and later on those who codified and did glosses on the rabbinic legal codes had to say about what communities could do to help give comfort to those who were really distressed by their dreams. So as we know, we'll read shortly in just a little bit that Yaakov awakened from his dream that takes place in a site that he'll come to name Beit El, the house of God, because he realizes upon waking up in this particular place that God was in this place, and he didn't even realize that God was in this place when he fell asleep there. He seems to have awoken from this dream, a dream about which he... Uh, we, we get to actually learn a little bit. If anybody here has ever tried to keep a dream diary, then uh, you know that it's not particularly easy to even conjure your dream clearly enough to express to yourself to write it down, right? Even if you were to try to wake yourself up in the middle of the night, and yet we, the audience, thousands and thousands of years later, we get to hear the details of someone else's dream, of Yaakov's dream, right? Olim v'yordim, these magical creatures were going up and down the ladder. I think that that is particularly cool, right? So, there's something about this dream, though, that the rabbis believe was distressing. It was distressing to Yaakov that he awoke and he didn't even know that God was in this place. So part of the waking up was this amazing realization and part of it was the distress of waking from a dream. All of us have had distressing dreams. That's something that goes back to the human psyche as it's existed. Ever since humans had something called a subconscious, we just didn't call it a subconscious. There's some part of our brain that's processing stuff while we're sleeping. And there's a story in the Gemara uh, that, that talks about how a few sages sat together, a mamra, that's not a joke, that was actually the name of a sage, and Marzutra and a few friends were sitting around and they were discussing, this is in a section in Brachot about dreams, they were discussing with one another what it was, just precisely what it was, uh, one uh, ought to do when they woke from dreams. Now this started because they said, let us each teach the other person something that they've never heard before which I think is kind of a funny like, way to start a rabbinic discussion. Like, you got it, now teach me something, but I got to never have heard it before, okay? It's a challenge. Uh, and so one said to the other, we don't know who said it to whom, that when somebody has a distressing dream, they should come forward and they should say, they should say before the congregation, and when should they say this? They should come up during birkat kohanim, during duchanim during the process of the priests blessing the congregation, saying that blessing that we say to our children in the evenings, etc., etc., they should come forward and they should say, God, I am yours and my dreams are yours. Right? And may you do with it, the, uh, the, the, um, the Gemara's text goes on to describe the suggested entire text of what one would go on to say. God, my dreams are yours. I am yours and my, and my dreams are yours. May it be that the dreams that I had this past evening become only for the best. May they only be fulfilled for the best, etc., etc. And it should come to be that since they will say it at the time while the priests are preparing and saying their blessings and the congregation will come to say, Amen. So then the congregation will also be saying, Amen, to the blessing that this person has individually put forward. God, may you make my dreams to be for the best, even the distressing and unsettling ones. The Shulchan Aruch comes along in the 16th century and says... 
that this should be done even in congregations where we do not do the priestly blessing. This should be done at the time when the chazan or the shaliach tzibor does just before sim shalom, elokeinu velokei avotenu, etc., etc. Yivarechecha Adonai v'yishmerecha, ye'er Adonai fanav elecha v'yichunecha, etc., etc. And we do that davening, we do that duchening, and someone should come forward and ask for the congregation to also say amen, to also say amen to those needs and to the needs for those blessings. So what this comes to teach us, I believe, is that somehow under literally the veil of the priestly blessing, it ought to be the case that whether we're talking about a distressing dream or anything in our life that is hovering, that we bring with us, figuratively speaking, into the synagogue space, that is so distressing that what we need to say is, God, I am yours these subconscious things that dwell with me are yours, may you make them to be for the best, that we should be able to ask the community around us to utter amen in such a way that it brings to us a wave of comfort. That we should say that at a time where we accept the amen of the community as a wave of comfort back to us. Because we should never let go of the fact that while this space is a space of public prayer, it's also a space that's dotted constantly with private prayers that are also taking place. Everyone is carrying with them individual things, many of them things that can't quite be put into words, right? distressing things that they sort of dreamt and haven't been able to describe yet. And when we say amen to people's blessings, what we are saying is that we affirm that they wish that all those things, even the things they haven't yet been able to turn into words, they should be for the best.